All righty. So today we're doing gases. We're going to do gas calculations, gas law calculations, all that good stuff. So uh, if you don't have a calculator handy, you're going to need it. You don't need it right this second. But just so you know, you will need that today. All right, so let's review the properties, physical properties of gases. Right, this is stuff that we learned um, first week of the class, so you shouldn't have to write it down because we learned it forever ago. Right, particles move independently of each other in the gas phase. Right, particles in the gas phase have higher energy than in the liquid and the solid state. Um, and the speed of those particles increases as we increase the temperature, right, because as we add temperature, as we um, increase the temperature, what we're doing is we're adding energy, right? If you, you know, increase the temperature, you're adding more energy, those particles are moving faster. They collide with their containers to create pressure, right? So if I take a balloon, blow it up, now I've got a nice inflated balloon. Why is that balloon inflated? Because I insert a gas into it, right? It's colliding with the walls of the balloons, it's creating pressure. We're feeling pressure right now from the atmosphere, pressing onto us. Um, and again, that pressure will increase with temperature, because if we increase the temperature, those particles are moving faster, and if they're colliding more frequently, right, you have higher pressure, which is why when it gets really cold, you might have noticed this on your car, though this week's not been all that cold, right, if you're driving in your car and it's 20 degrees outside, um, you get a little bing, your car says low pressure alert, I don't know, mine does, um, because after you've been driving with low, pre with the print temperature being so low, right, the pressure in your gas and the of your tires decreases because right? the particles in the gas phase in your tire are moving more slowly, they're colliding less frequently, and that makes the pressure go down. And a vacuum is when there's nothing, right? There are no particles. And so if there are no particles, then there is no pressure, right? So if you think about deep space, there's nothing, it's just empty, right? Empty space. Um, that would be no pressure. This is what we just talked about with atmospheric pressure. We're experiencing atmospheric pressure currently. Um, the collisions of the particles that we're breathing with us, right? And as you go up in elevation, pressure from the atmosphere decreases. Why? Why does atmospheric pressure decrease when you go up in elevation? Think about people who climb Mount Everest. Why do they, unless they're just a really, really daring person, take oxygen with them. What happens up at high elevation? There's not as much atmosphere, right? There's not as much oxygen. If you could see the particles in the air up at high elevation, right, you would see a lesser dense air than if you're at sea level, right? If you climb up to the top of a mountain and you could see the particles in the air, it would be thinner. It would be less dense than <coughs> down here at sea level, right? As you go up in elevation, you lose atmospheric pressure. So you can think about sports teams playing in Denver, that sort of thing, right? Um, high elevation, I mean, that's only a mile above sea level versus however many, um, you know, your tallest mountains are. But still, that mile can make a difference. If you've ever been to Denver, I didn't really notice it, but then again, I wasn't like playing tackle football or running a marathon or anything. I just went to Denver for fun, but, um, I mean, I guess if you're uh, doing some intense activities, high elevation like that, you could notice it. I didn't really notice it, but that was because I was just there doing sightseeing stuff. All right, vapor pressure is the pressure exerted by a gas that's from a liquid that is evaporating. Right, so if you have ethanol or water or whatever in this flask, it's not really just the liquid, is it? No, because some of that is evaporating, right? And some of that gas is coming back into the liquid phase, depending on what that temperature is, especially. But that pressure created by the gas directly above the liquid is called vapor pressure. All right, so in my bottle up here, right? In this space up here at the top, there is vapor pressure, right? Now I don't have the lid on it, but I could close the lid and I could actually measure that vapor pressure. Not sure why I'd want to, but I could, right? From that vapor that is evaporating. Now it's just the water that's evaporating. The stuff that's dissolved in this, the sugar and all that, because this is a homogeneous mixture, right? The sugar is not evaporating. 
right? It's not vaporizing, it's just the water. Just so you know that. Now, if we increase the temperature, we increase the vapor pressure. Why? Why would the vapor pressure be less, <laughs> be lower at 50 degrees versus 100 degrees? What's happening at 50 degrees that is, excuse me, what's happening at 100 degrees that isn't happening at 50? If we increase the temperature, are there going to be more particles going up? Or fewer particles going up, more, right? I mean, this is this is kind of the why things boil, right? I mean, if you really want to think about what causes things to boil, right? When you crank up your Bunsen burner, you're adding energy to this. Particles in the gas phase are in higher energy than particles in the liquid phase. So if you add energy to this system, you've got particles that now have enough energy to go be gas instead of be a liquid, right? So you have increased the vapor pressure. Vapor pressure here is higher because there's more vapor than there is here. And so the definition of boiling point, a chemist defines boiling point, the normal boiling point, at, as the temperature where the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. That's the definition of boiling point. If we were to define boiling point, that is a definition. It's the temperature where the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. So you've got Atmospheric pressure up to here, you've got to bring vapor pressure up to here for them to match. When that happens, you get boiling. That's what causes boiling to occur. Right? That's why we have to add energy to our beaker of water in order to make it boil. Because right now, under the conditions we're under, there's not enough vapor pressure to equal atmospheric pressure. Right? We've got to put energy in. Oops, wrong picture, right? So it's not boiling yet, right? The vapor pressure doesn't equal the atmospheric pressure yet. So we add some energy, and hey, now the vapor pressure inside equals the atmospheric pressure outside, and now I've got boiling. Does this make sense, how boiling works? And now obviously, what happens to boiling point if you go up in elevation? If there's less atmospheric pressure, do you have to put as much energy in to get the pressure inside to equal the pressure outside? No, you don't, right? The boiling point um, at the top of Mount Everest, I think, is like 70 something degrees Celsius, like 77 degrees Celsius versus 100, right? Vapor pressure is lower, so you have to put less energy in to make the, I mean, atmospheric pressure is lower. So you put less energy in to make the vapor pressure equal to outside pressure. Now, obviously, it'd be a really stupid idea to boil something with the lid on, right? I just took a stock picture and put a stock picture underneath it. You wouldn't want to boil something with the lid on. Why would that be a, a bad life choice? It'll just shoot out, yeah. That would not be a safe lab choice. All right, let's talk about diffusion. I think you know this word from biology or physical science or high school, right? It's just spreading out. You, sp you go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, right? So if I've got perfume up here, or air freshener, or whatever, right? If I spray the perfume or the air freshener or cologne or whatever, right? That's a very high concentration right here. And then eventually it's going to be, everybody in the back of the room can smell it, right? Now, depending on the volume you dispense, that would determine how much diffusion it does, right? If I spray it 20 times versus once, right? If I spray it 20 times, everybody's gonna be like, <laughs> right? But if I spray it once, that's a significantly less volume. But still, diffusion's gonna occur. I think we all know this word, right? Yes. Okay, the rate of diffusion is determined by molar mass. This makes sense. If you're small, you're gonna diffuse faster. And if you're large, right? So if I have two perfumes, one of them diffuses faster than the other. Let's pretend I spray two perfumes. One smells like, well, let's use air freshener because that's easier. One smells like pine trees and the other one smells like vanilla frosting, right? And you smell pine trees first. Which one would have the lower molar mass? The pine tree one, right? Because it's diffusing faster, 
Now we're assuming that I dispense the equal volume, we're assuming that the room is homogeneous in temperature and all that good stuff, right? But if I just assume that there's no gas escaping through the air ducts or that there are no pockets of hot air anywhere, if I spray, what did I say, pine trees and vanilla frosting at the same time and you smell vanilla frosting first, right? That would be because it had a lower molar mass. Assuming we're at equal temperature throughout the room and all that. Does this make sense? Small particle is going to diffuse faster than a larger particle. And if you take biology, you even do this experiment, or at least I think you do, right? Where you put the different drops of dye and you watch them spread out. Isn't that something you do in biology? Maybe. No? Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Now, effusion is escape through a hole. It's escape through a tiny hole. That's what effusion is. So this is like a slow leak in your tire. Right? If you puncture your tire, it's slowly leaking. This is an experiment that I actually had my students do as a home lab one time. Um, I can't remember the reason. Maybe we were just doing it for the sake of doing it. Anyway, um, it's an experiment that you can do. Uh, you can do it, you know, this weekend. I'm gonna do some gas fun. You can go to, you know, your florist or the grocery store section <laughs> where they'll feel a helium balloon for you. You know, they'll get a helium balloon filled up. And then you have another balloon that you fill up yourself, right? So you've got one that's full of helium, one that's essentially nitrogen, right? Because we're breathing mostly nitrogen right now. It's about 70%, right? So mostly nitrogen versus helium, right? N2's molar mass is 28. Heliums is what, four point something something, okay? So if you put a piece of tape on the balloon, you have to put a piece of tape on the balloon because if you just stick a needle in it, it pops, right? But if you put a piece of just, you know, regular old tape on the balloon and then take your safety pin or your needle and puncture it through the piece of tape, the piece of tape holds the tension of the balloon and it doesn't burst. So you can actually make a balloon with a teeny tiny little hole in it. And you can monitor which one effuses faster? And obviously there's gonna be a significant difference there, right? Assuming that your holes are of equal size and all that stuff. But molar mass of 28 versus molar mass of four, that's a pretty significant difference. And you will see one deflate significantly faster than the other. Right, so here's basically what I just said, <laughs> using a helium balloon versus a nitrogen balloon, right? The helium balloon deflated way faster than the nitrogen balloon did. Why? Lower molar mass, right? Going to effuse, it's going to diffuse faster. And gases separate by density just like any other substance would, right? So if I had a tank, let's pretend I had a tank full of a mixture of gases. Let's just pretend it's got helium and argon and neon in it, right? So molar mass is a 4, 20, and 30, whatever, right? Got three gases in here. And I just open the valve and I let it all out, right? Where's the helium gonna be? Is it gonna be hanging out at the bottom of the room or up at the ceiling? It'd be way up at the ceiling, right? It's lower molar mass, less dense. So gases behave in that sense the same as you would expect liquids in a beaker to do, right? If you have three layers of liquids of different densities, they're separating by density, and you would expect gases to do that too, right? The helium's gonna all gonna go up to the top of the room, krypton's gonna be lower on the bottom of the room. So we're going to use Graham's Law. This is a very easy calculation, so don't start panicking. Graham's Law to calculate the ratio of differences between rates, okay? Because the lighter weight one will diffuse and effuse faster than the lower one. So what we do is we take the square root of the ratio of molar masses, B over A. B is always the heavier one. So B is bigger, B for bigger, right? The bigger number goes on top, the smaller number goes on bottom, and then you take the square root of that. Where MM stands for molar mass. Okay, molar mass of the bigger divided by molar mass of the smaller, and then take the square root of that. And that tells you how many times faster the smaller one is going than the bigger one. Now we have to be at the same temperature, okay? If this gas is at, uh, 500 Kelvin, and this gas is at 400 Kelvin, are they comparable? No, right, because different temperatures 
inherently have more speed. Okay, so you have to be at the same temperature. Make sure you understand that this has to be at the same temperature. If one's at 35 and one's at 55, that's not a valid comparison. Okay, so the bigger numbers, molar mass is on top, smaller numbers, molar mass is on bottom, and you just take the square root. MM stands for molar mass. And this will be unitless, right, because your units here are grams per mole, your units here are grams per mole, grams per mole, grams per mole, grams per mole cancel out. So this will be unitless. So here's an example. What's the ratio of effusion rates between H2 and UF6? Before we even pick up our calculator, I think we know which one's going to be effusing faster. Which one? H2 or UF6? H2, right? Because this molar mass is 2.016. UF6 is, is significantly larger than that. So which one's going on top? The molar mass of UF6 or the molar mass of H2? The more massive one goes on top, right? So 2 versus 352, that's going to be a pretty big difference. So we just take the square root of those two numbers being divided by each other, and we get 13.2. Now what does that tell me? What does that tell me? That tells me that H2 is going to effuse 13.2 times faster than UF6. Does that make sense? 13.2 times faster. This one's moving 13 times faster. That's what that number tells me. Now if you get a number like 0 0.00000075, you know you did it upside down, right? Because it should be a number greater than one because the bigger number is always on top, okay? So if you get a number that's a 0 .000 something, right, you know your factor's upside down because these are numbers going to be greater than one. And is that a reasonable answer? Would you expect molar masses that far apart to have a pretty significant difference in speeds and effusion rates? Yeah, definitely. Two versus 352. I mean, if I say to you, hey, I'm going to give you $2, or hey, I'm going to give you $352, I think you'd be a lot happier with the second one than the first, right? That's a pretty significant difference. And um, so you would expect 13 times faster. That's reasonable. Again, if you get 0 0.00003, that's not reasonable, right? That means you're backwards. You flipped it. Does everybody see how to do this? Like I said, it's easy calculation. So why don't you try this one? How many times faster will helium gas diffuse than nitrogen gas? Helium gas versus nitrogen gas. I'll pause the video and give you a second. All right. So the one thing we need to ask ourselves when we're dealing with gas is, is am I dealing with a monatomic or a poly, a monatomic or a diatomic? Right, because there are seven gases that are diatomic, right? Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Right? Those are all diatomic. So that affects the molar mass, right? So is the molar mass of helium affected by that? Is it diatomic? Is it HE or HE2? It's just HE, right? But what about nitrogen? Is it N or N2 as a gas? It's N2, right? So its molar mass is not 14, it's 28. So 28 divided by 4, take the square root, 2.7. Now that's a whole lot different than the previous one where we got 13. But think about why. In the previous one, we were dealing with 2 versus 352. Right? That's a big difference versus 4 and 28. Right? Those two numbers are a lot closer together. Three, excuse me, 2 and 352 versus 4 and 28. Those are a lot closer. So that's why this number is a lot smaller than in the previous problem. So that's why that number works. I mean, helium gas is still going to be going faster. Right. Does this make sense? Makes sense. Okay, see if you can figure this one out. Hydrogen gas diffuses 15 times faster than a mystery gas. What is the molar mass of the mystery gas? See if you can solve this problem. All right, let's see if we can do this one. 
So the key here is in setting up the problem, right? I'm telling you that it's going 15 times faster. So that means it's being set equal to 15, right? Something over something, square root is equal to 15. Yes, because it's 15 times faster. Now the molar mass of H2, 2.016, right? So when I set up my proportion, is the mystery gas, which we'll just call X, is it gonna be on top or on bottom? On top, right, because this is going faster. So that means it's the lighter one, right? So 2.016X over 2.016. Do you see why it's set up this way? Because it's faster, right? If hydrogen's faster, that means it's got the lower molar mass. So how do I get rid of a square root? Square. square both sides, right? Square both sides. So now we have x over 2.016 is equal to 15 squared. And then how would I get x by itself? You just multiply both sides by 2.016. So x is just 15 squared times 2.016. And then my units would be grams per mole. Does everyone see how we did the math there? So it's all in how it's being set up, right? I told you it was 15 times faster. That's why 2.016 is on the bottom. So I got 454 as my final answer. That makes sense too, because for it to be 15 times faster, that had better be a pretty big molar mass, right? If it's 15 times faster, that had better be a pretty big molar mass. So, you know, maybe someone got out some really stinky cheese. That's a big biomolecule. That would have a high molar mass. All right, why don't you try this one? They're all at the same temperature. Rank them in order of increasing speed. See if you can figure this out. Ammonia, sulfur trioxide, and chlorine gas. And I've even told you that chlorine's diatomic. Rank them in order of increasing speed. See if you can figure this one out. There's no math required, I'll give you that much. See if you can figure it out. All right, let's look at this one. Now they're all at the same temperature, right? They have to be all be at the same temperature for us to do this. So what do we look at to rank them? All we have to do is look at the Molar mass, right? Molar mass. And if we're ranking them by increasing speed, does that mean the slowest one goes first or last? The slowest one goes first, right? So that means the largest molar mass or the lightest molar mass? The heaviest one's first, right? And the lightest one is last. So all you have to do is calculate molar mass is 80 versus 71 versus 73, or 17, excuse me. Right? So, this one's the heaviest, yes. This one's second in line, and then there's a pretty big jump between these two, right? Because as you increase the molar mass, you're decreasing its speed. Now again, we can only do this if they were all three at the same temp, right? If one was at a different temperature than the other two, we couldn't do it this way. But we're just assuming that everybody's at the same temperature. Does this make sense? All right, this is a statement you hear a lot on um if you listen to baseball maybe not so much anymore but i haven't listened to baseball in a long time uh, baseballs travel more slowly on a humid day because the air is heavier ever heard that before maybe you know someone who plays baseball or softball and you're like oh it's just they go through the air slower has anyone ever heard that is that true or false True or false, true or false, true or false. I think you probably want to say true, but you probably know the answer is false, right? Based on the way my face looks right now, right? This is false. That's false. It's a false statement. Let's think about why. The thing that makes it wrong is the heavier part, right? The air is definitely not heavier on a humid day. And let's think about why, okay? Well, if it's a humid day, 
humid day, that means that there's a lot of what in the atmosphere? Water, right? There's a lot of water. So we're increased percentage of H2O in the air. Okay, H2O's got a molar mass of what? This is two times one plus 16. So it's got a molar mass of 18, all right? Normal air, normal air, normally we're breathing about 70% into, so that'd be 28 grams per mole, breathing a lot of CO2, 44 grams per mole, breathing a lot of O2, that's 16 grams per mole, that one's lighter than that. But the predominant biggest influence right here is 28 CO2, right, those are all heavy. Those are a lot heavier. So if you've got an increased amount of H2O, that means that the proportions of these heavy ones actually go down, right, because it's, it's all about a balance, right? So if you've got a lot of H2O in the air, that means that the ones that are heavy are actually at a lower proportion. So if it's really, really humid, the air is actually lighter, right? Because you've got a higher proportion of something with a low molar mass. Now, does it mean that it feels nasty? Yeah, it feels nasty because our skin, you know, touches all that community and we just go, right? But the hair itself is actually Fun fact, now I know this doesn't really apply to us now that it's, you know, almost December, uh, but still something to think about when springtime rolls around and you're watching baseball. Well, I was like in Colorado, I'm sure you've noticed what's going on during Joshua Ford's series. Uh-huh. My brother was here. It was crazy for me because his balls were really blue. Like, I've never seen Oh, really? That's cool. Well, there you go. Helping support that. You might feel disgusting, but yeah, the, the air is definitely not heavier. All right, let's talk about some gas calculations. Calculations we're gonna do doing using gases. Now these are not hard calculations, it's just we have to watch what we're doing. That's the only key. So let's talk about pressure because that's a big important part of gas calculations. Um, we're gonna be dealing with pressure. Obviously we don't measure the pressure of a liquid. We don't measure the pressure of a solid. That's just a pointless thing to do. But we do measure the pressure of a gas, right? Because gases pressure is variable. We can compress a gas and increase its pressure. We can increase the temperature of a gas and increase its pressure. So because of that, we need to talk about what pressure is. Pressure is just force per unit of area. And a lot of our calculations are in atmospheres. Now I gave everybody a handout with these conversion factors on it, right? Everybody have one of these? These conversion factors will be given to you, okay? I will give you these conversion factors on your next test next test being the final. So this will be on your reference page. But you would need to be able to convert it. Okay, so if I say the pressure is 800 millimeters mercury, what is that in atmospheres? Right, you would need to be able to set up a conversion factor using this handout. Okay, now this will be on your next test as a reference information. So like I said, I'll give you these conversions. You need to set up the conversion factor and do the arithmetic, okay? So millimeters mercury and tor, those are the same thing. Um, one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters mercury, 760 tor. Atmospheres to pascals, 101,000. Atmospheres to kilopascals, 101. Okay, so let's just do a little bit of practice. The pressure of a gas is 59 tor. What is that pressure in millimeters mercury? What is that pressure in atmospheres? What's that atmosphere in pascals? And what's that atmosphere, I mean, what's that pressure in kilopascals? So use your handout, set up a conversion factor. Unit you want to go away is on the bottom. Unit you want to keep is on the top. I'll pause the video and then uh, we'll go over these. So let's go through this one. So we need to write some conversion factors. All right, so we've got 59 tor, and we're converting it to millimeters mercury. That's easy, because what's the conversion factor for tor to millimeters mercury? It's the same thing, right? So 59 tor is the same thing as 59 millimeters mercury. So that one's easy. You don't even have to write a conversion factor. It's one tor and one millimeter mercury are the same thing. Okay, let's convert it to atmospheres. Let's just take that number and use it. Or we could use tor, either one. 
59 millimeters mercury. How do we convert millimeters mercury to atmosphere? Millimeters mercury will be on bottom, right? That's the one we want to get rid of. Atmospheres goes on top. Look at your handout. One atmosphere is equal to how many? 760 millimeters mercury, right? So multiply straight across and divide up. Keeping two significant figures, because this is just, we're treating like a constant. Even though it has two sig figs as well. So 59 divided by 760. That gives me 0 0.0776315, which I would then round to two sig figs. So 0 0.078 and my unit would be atmospheres. Do we agree? All right, let's convert that number to Pascals. We don't know how to convert millimeters mercury to Pascals. I mean, you can, but that's not one of the ones that I gave you on your handout. But I did tell you how to convert atmospheres to Pascals, right? I did tell you how to do that. So 0.078 atmospheres. Atmospheres goes on bottom, I want to get rid of it. And Pascal's goes on top. What's the ratio? One atmosphere is equal to how many? 101,325. So times 101,325. Again, we're keeping two sig figs because we're treating this like a constant. My calculator tells me. 7866.0197. Of course, that's way too many sig figs, right? So, how do I round that to two sig figs? 7900, right? And my units would be pascals. Now, when you do the kilopascals, the only difference between pascals and kilopascals is you've divided by a thousand, right? So, 0.078 atmospheres times 101.325. It's going to give you the exact same number, except now you've divided by 1,000. Right? So it would just be 7.9 kPa. Do we agree on these? Any questions on pressure conversions? Okay, to erase. Even though the answers are in the slide, I always like to show the conversion factor if I can, just so that you can see it work out start to finish. All right, so when we're doing gas law calculations, our pressure needs to be in atmospheres, okay? Our volume needs to be in liters. When you see a little n, lowercase n, that stands for number of moles. When you see a uppercase t, that stands for Kelvin temperature. How do you convert Celsius to Kelvin? Who remembers? Celsius to Kelvin, you add a certain number. What number do you add? 273. 273. And then R is a constant. It's 0.08206 and it has crazy units. Its units are liter atmosphere per mole Kelvin. So after you get this information jotted down, once everyone's got it into their notes, we're gonna take a little bit of a brain break since we've been at it for about an hour now. You know your rear end probably needs a break. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause the recording. And then once you've got this jotted down, if you need to go to the bathroom or get a drink of water or whatever. All right, let's get started again. We're gonna talk about one more set of conditions you need to be aware of. If I tell you that we are at STP, STP stands for standard temperature and pressure. So if I tell you that a reaction's taking place or a process is occurring at STP, 
That means that the pressure is one atmosphere and the temperature is zero degrees Celsius. So are we at STP right now? We're really darn close to standard pressure. I think I looked it up the other day. Our pressure here for our elevation is like 1.05, maybe, atmospheres. It's like 1.05 or 1.06. So we're pretty darn close to SP, but are we at standard temperature right here? Is it zero degrees in this room? No, right? Zero degrees Celsius would be freezing point. So we are not at standard temperature. We are pretty close to standard pressure, though. Rounding to one sig fig, we would say we're at standard pressure. We're not at standard temperature. It's about 23 degrees Celsius in this room. 23, 24, somewhere around there. Kind of cool in here. Okay, so if I say you're at STP, that's what we mean. We're at a pressure of one and a temperature of zero Celsius. Not zero Kelvin. Right, zero Kelvin is called absolute zero. All right, so take a second and jot these down. Here are your, you okay? You got some tissues if you need them. These are the gas laws that we'll be using. Now on your next test, which is the final, I will give you all these gas laws. Okay, they will be on the reference page. I'm not gonna make you memorize them. You just need to know when to use each one. And the way you know which gas law to pick is you just look at the problem. If your problem deals with pressures and temperatures, then you would use this one, okay? If your problem deals with volumes and number of moles, you would use this one. Anytime you see a one and a two, the one stands for initial, the two stands for final, okay? So initially you were at this pressure and volume, and now you're at this pressure and volume, okay? So, I will give you the problems, I mean, give you the equations, well, obviously, I'll give you the problem, too. I'll give you the equation, and then you look at the problem and figure out which gas law you need to use. So, if you did gas laws in high school, you probably learned the names, Boyle's Law and Charles Law and Avogadro's Law, all that good stuff. I'm not going to make you memorize the name, which one's Boyle's Law. That's not relevant to you being able to do the arithmetic. That's not relevant to you being able to understand how to do the problem. Okay, if you memorize that P1V1 equals P2V2 is called Boyle's Law, in the grand scheme of life, I just don't think that's really gonna matter. But if you understand how to use Boyle's Law, that's what matters. All right, so again, I'll give you the formulas, you just read the problem and figure out which one we need to use. And that's it, that's it. That's so all it gets, right? This math, it doesn't look very scary. Multiplying and dividing is the worst it's gonna get. No square roots, no exponents, no logs, none of that, right? Just straight up multiplying and dividing. So the way I recommend doing this is when you read the problem, list out your variables. P equals, T equals. Oh, okay, this is a P and T problem. Make sure you convert your units if you need to, then pick your gas law, and then from there it's just arithmetic. Okay, so this little bit, that's what I recommend doing. So just read the problem and list out any variables that the problem gives you. Make any necessary conversions. Figure out the gas law that deals with those variables. And then from there, it's just either multiply or divide as needed. Just a reminder, your homework that's due tonight is your second to last homework of the semester, right? Your last homework set, so sad, will be posted today. You'll have until next Wednesday, and um, that'll be your last, last homework of the semester. So I'll put that up today. All right, so let's do this one together. A sample of argon gas originally, there we go, 
don't know if that made it better or worse. A sample of argon gas originally occupied 14.6 liters. So liters, is that a volume of pressure or temperature what? That's a volume, right? And it said originally, so that would be V1, is equal to 14.6 liters at 25 degrees Celsius. So degrees Celsius, that's a what? That's a temperature, right? 25 degrees Celsius. Was heated to 50 degrees Celsius. So that's T1. T2 is 50 degrees Celsius. What is the new volume? Okay. So does everyone see what I did? I just read the problem. Anytime I came across a number, I asked myself, okay, is that a volume, a temperature, a pressure, a number of moles, what? All right, just list out the variables. Okay, this problem is dealing with volume and temperature. So now everybody look at your list of gas laws. There they are. Which one deals with volume and temperature? It's the one that's kind of funky right now, right? V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, right? Let's write it somewhere else because I'm going to need that space here in a second. Right? This is the one we're dealing with. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, right? We picked this gas law because we've got V's and T's. Does everyone see why we picked that gas law? Yes? Yes. Do we need to do any unit converting? What do our units need to be? Can volume be in liters? If you need a reminder, let's go back here. Pressure is not part of this problem. Volume's in liters, which it already is. N is not part of this problem. Temperature in Kelvin. Is that okay? No, that's in degrees Celsius, right? So I've got to convert that. So, I'm going to pause the recording. I want you to try this one. Make any necessary conversions. I know not everyone's quite finished, but that's okay. So, we need to do a little bit of converting first, right? Leaders we can leave alone. What's our new temperature initially? 298. And what's our new final temperature? 323. We're solving for V2, right? So we can just plug everything in and do our arithmetic. You can do your arithmetic a couple different ways. You can do it by cross multiplying, that'd work. Or you can just plug everything in and rearrange. Either way, it's gonna work the same way. So 14.6 over 298 is equal to X over 323. Do we agree? So you can do this however you want. If you prefer to do cross multiplying, because that's what you learned in high school to solve fractions, that works. Um, you can, however you want to do it. What, what did you guys do, just so I know? What's your preferred method? You like cross multiplying? Okay, we can cross multiply. So, if we cross multiply, cross those, cross those. So that would say 298 x is equal to 14.6 times 323 gives me 4715.8. So divide both sides by 298. So x equals, divide by 298, 15.8248. How many seed things am I keeping? Well, this is 50.0, I forgot to write that. It's 
and that's 25, no zero, so two. So that would be what? 16, and what will my units be? This is a volume, right? So my unit would be meters. Is everyone good on the algebra here? All right, so that's the method we're gonna use. You just list all your variables, decide which gas law is appropriate to use, and then do your math. So why don't you try this one? A 16 liter oxygen tank is pressurized to 37 atmospheres when the temperature is 38 degrees Celsius. How many moles are in the tank? I'll pause the recording, let you try, and then we'll go over it. So let's go over this one. So let's list out our problem, what the problem tells us. We've got a pressure, because it says pressurized to 37 atmospheres, pressure of 37. When the temperature is 38 degrees Celsius, it wants to know how many moles, what variable is that, in, are in the tank. Oh, and it's 16 liters. I was like, we're missing a variable. Okay, so if we look at our gas laws, which gas law works here? There's only one, PV equals NRT, right? That one's called the ideal gas law, right? Because that's the only one that doesn't deal with a before and an after, right? So let's uh, look at our variables here and see if we need to do any converting. Can I leave this in the atmospheres? Yes. What's my temperature, though? It should be what? 311 Kelvin. Number of moles is what I'm solving for. 16 liters, is that okay? Yep, so the gas law that we're dealing with is the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. What's R? R isn't in the problem. It's a constant, right? 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. All right, so we're solving for N here. So now we just plug everything in to solve for N. Or you can rearrange this and then plug in. Either way, you'll get the same answer. So 37 and 16 is equal to N times 0 0.08206 times temperature, 311. Right, so 37 times 16, I got 592 is equal to 0 0.08206 times 311, 25.52 N, right? So divide both sides by 25.52. I can smell some experiment going on next door. I don't know about you guys. 592 divided by 25.52. Your calculator doesn't know anything about sig figs, right? It just spits out a number. 197492. How many sig figs can we keep? How many sig figs? Two, right? So what's my answer? 23, and what will my units be? N is moles, right? Did you get it right? Get it right? If you made a mistake, you see where you made it? Starting to get the hang of how we do this? Just list your variables and then pick the gas law that works. Because there's only gonna be one correct gas law that will be a rational, reasonable answer. If you start plugging into a gas law and you realize, hey, this isn't working out, probably pick the wrong gas law. All right, try this one. Pressure cookers work by increasing the pressure and thus cooking your food faster. You try using a pressure cooker to make some dinner. The pressure inside the cooker at 158 degrees Celsius is 27 atmospheres. What's the temperature inside the cooker if you decrease the pressure to 17 atmospheres? I'll pause the recording and let's try this one. All right, let's go over this one. Our pressure cooker problem. So, 
I have to advance the slide so I have room to write. You using a pressure cooker, pressure inside the cooker, uh, temperature is 158. And pressure is 27. And what's the temperature? So that's T2. When the pressure is reduced to 17. All right, let me give myself some space to write here. There we go. All right, so which gas law deals with T's and P's? Are they being multiplied or divided? Which one is it? It's T1 over P1, right? Or is it P1 over T1? Which one? Which one? P over T or T over P? It's P over T, right? P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. So, P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. Do we have to do any converting? What's our new temperature? 431. Okay. So, we just plug everybody in. 27 over... 431 is equal to 17 over X. All right, you guys prefer cross multiplying? That's the method you prefer? That's fine by me. I don't care what method you use. Makes no difference to me. So if we cross multiply, that would give us 27X is equal to 431 times 17. 7327. Seven. So to get X by itself, by 27, 271.37 is what X comes out to be. How many seek figs do I keep? How many? Two, right? Because this has two seek figs, this has two seek figs. So how do I round that to two seek figs? 270 with no decimal, right? And what would my unit be here? This is Kelvin, right? Unless I specifically ask you to convert it back to Celsius, you don't have to. Okay, if I said, what's the Celsius temperature, then yes, you'd convert it back to Celsius. Do we agree on this one, 270? All right, last one for you to do. I'll pause the recording. The volume and pressure inside a weather balloon on the ground Oh, that's hard to read. Are 380 liters and 1.01 atmospheres, respectively. When the weather balloon floats up into the atmosphere, where the pressure is 0.7 atmospheres, what would the volume be inside the balloon? I'll right, pause the recording. Let's go over this one. So, the problem tells me, well, I've got a predicament here. Let's see, the problem tells me that the volume initially is 380 liters, and the pressure initially is 1.01 atmospheres, and then when it floats up, the new pressure is 0 0.70 atmospheres, and I want to know what the new volume is. So let's give myself some room right here. Which gas law deals with volume and pressure? Are they multiplied or divided? It's P1V1 equals P2V2, right? So let's see. P1 is 1.01, V1 is 380. I didn't have to do any converting, right? Because liters and atmospheres are both units that I'm allowed to use. P2 is 0 0.70, and V2 is what we're solving for. So, leave it alone. So, 1.01 times 380. 
So we get 383.8 is equal to 0 0.70x. x equals divided by 27, 548.28571. I obviously can't keep all those sig figs. How many sig figs can I keep? Two sig figs, right? Because this has two, this has three, this has two. So how do I round that to two sig figs? I can't round it to 540. That wouldn't be appropriate because it's 548, so what should I round it to? 550. And what is my new unit? This is a volume, so it's liters. All right, don't pack up yet, I've got something for you. So these are some problems that I didn't know how much time we'd have in class to do them. So I'm gonna put them up, whoops. I'm gonna put them up here, and I'm gonna give you a hard copy, but if you are an online student <coughs> watching this video, you can have access to these problems this way. So here are the problems, and then in a second, I'll put up the answers. So you can just jot the answers down on this paper, and then you can try them sometime on your own time, okay? I really recommend that you try these out because gases, like I said, the math isn't all that hard. It's just uh, paying close attention. So here are the problems. Again, if you're watching this online, you just pause the recording, try them, and then when you're ready to see the answers, you kids on campus, here are the answers. So you jot these down or I guess you could go to the video. The answers, 16 liters, 270 Kelvin, increase the temperature, eight moles, two atmospheres, negative 260 degrees Celsius, 2.1, and then ethane, fluorine, yeah, fluorine, argon, and nitrogen dioxide. So on campus, people, once you've got this jotted down, you're free to go. And if you're watching this online, you can obviously pause this whenever you want. Have a good day, and I'll see you next time.